Hi there. In chapter 4, we discussed linear regression with a single regressor, where the intercept coefficient beta naught and the slope coefficient beta 1 are unknown. And we explained the OLS estimator of the intercept coefficient beta naught head and the OLS estimator of the slope coefficient beta 1 head. And so the OLS predicted value is yi. These estimators are calculated using a random sample. They take different values from one sample to other. They are random variables with a probability distribution that is called sampling distribution. Their sampling distributions summarize the probability of these different values. At this point, I highly recommend you to watch Chapter 3, Part 3 video where we discussed the sampling distribution of the sample mean and explained that the sampling distribution was approximately normal because of the central limit theorem. In this video, we will talk about large sample distributions of beta naught head and beta 1 head. Under the least squares assumptions, in large samples, OLS estimators beta naught head and beta 1 head have a joint and normal sampling distributions. The large sample normal distribution of beta 1 head is and the large sample normal distribution of beta naught head is under the least squares assumptions beta 1 head is an unbiased estimator of beta 1 under the least squares assumptions beta naught head is an unbiased estimator of beta naught and the variance of this distribution is given by The variance have the sample size n in the denominator of the formula. So as n increases, the variance decreases to zero. When n is large, the distribution of the OLS estimator will be clustered around its mean. The variance of beta 1 head is inversely proportional to the square of the variance of independent variable xi, which implies that the larger the variance of xi, the smaller is the variance of beta 1 head. The variance of beta 1 head is directly proportional to the variance of the error ui, which implies that the smaller is the variance of the error, the smaller is the variance of beta 1 head. This is the variance of the sampling distribution of beta 1 head. We will use the following estimator of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which is called the standard error of the OLS estimator beta 1 head. And then we will have a discussion on hypothesis tests and confidence interval to make inferences about the true population value in the regression slope coefficient beta 1 using a sample. Before giving the standard error of beta 1 head, let me write a variance of the sampling distribution of beta naught head. The standard error of beta 1 head is the square root of estimator of the variance. The standard error of the OLS estimator beta 1 head is an estimator of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. The estimator of the variance is given by this formula. For a homework question, you will need to use this formula for standard error calculation. But in applications, the standard error is computed by the software of choice. In the homework question, for example, if you're given the sample size n, the sum of squares of xi from the mean x in the denominator and the sum of the product of square deviations and the square of the residuals in the numerator, it shouldn't be difficult to calculate a standard error of beta 1 head by simply plugging given values into the formula. Don't forget to take the square root of this expression to find a standard error. In chapter 4 videos, we used a sample of 400 observations on open city school districts to regress test scores on student-teacher ratios. And we obtained the estimated OLS regression as negative 1.12 is an estimate for the OLS estimator of the slope coefficient beta 1. But we understand that if we had another sample of 400 observations, we would have a different estimate for the beta 1 head. Is there evidence in our data that this slope is non-zero? I can restate what we want to test here. We want to test whether or not this estimate is statistically significant. We want to test whether student-teacher ratios have any effect on test scores. 
probably you already guessed that we will do hypothesis tests. The null hypothesis would consider the slope coefficient to be zero. The null hypothesis assumes that the student-teacher ratios don't have any effect on test scores, or there is no significant effect of student-teacher ratios on test scores. The alternative hypothesis would be the slope coefficient to be non-zero. The alternative hypothesis assumes that the student-teacher ratios have a significant effect on the test scores. If you haven't watched chapter 3 videos, feel free to stop this video here to watch them first, since hypothesis tests and confidence interval were explained in details where the population characteristic was the population mean mu. Differently, here we have the population slope coefficient beta 1, which takes on a specific value, 0, that is, the hypothesized value. To test the null hypothesis, we follow the same steps as for the population mean in chapter 3 videos. We will find the t-statistic and then the p-value to decide whether to reject or fail to reject a null hypothesis at a pre-specified significance level. In general, we can write a null and alternative hypothesis as here we have two-sided test where the beta 1 comma 0 is the hypothesized value. Hope you understand why we have talked about the OLS estimator beta 1 hat as a random variable who is approximately normally distributed in large samples. In large samples, under the null hypothesis, the t-statistic as a random variable has approximately standard normal distribution. t-statistic is the standardized version of beta 1 hat. The center of the distribution is beta 1. And under the null hypothesis, beta 1 is assumed to be the hypothesized value. So we have, remember how we standardize. From the estimator, we'll subtract the center of the distribution and then divide by the standard deviation, which is, in our case, is the standard error of the estimator. After computing the t-statistic, let's call it t-act, actually calculated t-statistic can be negative or positive, then the p-value will be the sum of the probability t greater than the positive of actually calculated t. And the probability that t is less than the negative of the actually calculated t. Here's how we can write this probability mathematically. Solution to this inequality involving absolute value is either t is greater than what you see on the right hand side or t is less than the negative of the right hand side number which is this probability is the area in the right tail. The second probability is the area in the left tail. The areas in the right and left tails are identical, so we can write it as, since these probabilities are equal, we can write the sum as two times the area in the left tail. So we can find this probability using the standard normal cumulative distribution function denoted by phi. Therefore, we'll have Let's go back to our example and calculate t statistic. Beta 1 hit is negative 1.12 minus hypothesized value is 0, but we don't know the denominator, the standard error of beta 1 hat. In chapter 4, when we regress test score on student teacher ratio using the sample in Excel by data, data analysis, then choosing regression, we had the following regression output. Estimated slope coefficient is negative 1.12, estimated intercept coefficient 674.4, and the standard error of beta 1 hat is 0 0.45. 8.957 is the standard error of beta naught hat. Let's include the standard errors in our regression equation. Here's the common way of reporting a single regression equation. And the standard error of beta 1 hat is 0.45 if we round. And the standard error of beta 1 hat is 8.96 if we round. The R square and standard error of the regression 17.2. Our null and alternative hypotheses were and a t statistic. Beta 1 hat is negative 1.12. 
hypothesized value is 0, divided by the standard error of beta 1 hat, which is 0.45, then actually calculated t statistic is negative 2.49, if we round. t act is negative 2.49, which is a negative number. The absolute value of t act is 2.49, and negative of absolute value of negative 2.49 is negative 2.49. The p-value is the sum of areas in the right and left tails. p-value is 2 times the probability that t is less than negative 2.49, or in terms of the cumulative standard normal distribution function, phi, 2 times phi of negative 2.49. Phi of negative 2.49 is the area under the cumulative standard normal distribution function to the left of negative 2.49. In previous videos, I used an Excel function to find the area. This time, let's use a table. Z is negative 2.49. Find negative 2.4 in this column. Then find 9 in this row, where the row for negative 2.4 and the column for 9 intersect gives us the phi of negative 2.49, the area to the left of negative 2.49, which is 0 0.0064. Then we'll find the p-value is 2 times 0 0.0064, that is 0 0.013 if we round. At 5% significance level, when alpha is 0.05, p-value is less than alpha. So we reject the null in favor of the two-sided alternative. However, we fail to reject the null at 1% significance level, since p-value 0.013 is greater than 1%. Assume that we think smaller classes provide higher test scores. By smaller classes, we mean less students per teacher, in other words, smaller student-teacher ratio. Here, we want to test whether student-teacher ratio has negative effect on test score. Then we will try to find evidence to support that beta 1 is less than 0. So we will test the null hypothesis of beta 1 equals 0 against beta 1 is negative. Obviously, we will have the same calculated test statistic but the p-value will be different, since we have one-sided alternative hypothesis. For our one-sided alternative hypothesis, the p-value will be the area in the left tail, area to the left of negative 2.49. By using the table, we found the area in the left tail as 0 0.0064. We could find this area by using the following Excel function as well. At 5% significance level, since the p-value less than 5%, we reject the null hypothesis.